Um, <laughs> it's my great pleasure to welcome Daniel Wigdor here. Uh, many of us have known Daniel for, um, well, it seems like much longer than it's actually been, but <laughs> uh, he's been a great person to collaborate with over the years. We've done book chapters together, papers, uh, many informal, fun conversations, the occasional beer at conferences. Um, and he's done a great series of work on many topics. Um, but today, particularly, he's going to highlight some things he's done on cross-device and multi-device interaction, uh, both designing and building such systems. Um, so I'm just looking forward to how we'll regale us with tales of the wilderness of multiple devices. Thanks, Ken. Uh, it's great to, to be here. Hey, Bill. Uh, I, was, I was always hoping you'd be here, of course. But uh, I'm, uh, as, uh, as some of you may know, I'm from Toronto, from the University of Toronto. And uh, in particular, from the DGP Lab, the Dynamic Graphics Project, which a couple of years ago had its 50th anniversary. Uh, and uh, one of the students made this word cloud of our various alumni. And so uh, where is Bill? There's Bill, right there. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to have come from, as uh, Christian says, snowy Toronto to uh, come and talk to you about multiple devices today. So those of you who aren't familiar with DGP, or just to give you an update on what's been going on at DGP, uh, over the last few years, we've sort of exploded in size. So uh, just in the last couple of years, we've hired uh, four new HCI faculty members and two new graphics uh, faculty members as well. So it's become quite a large uh, group at uh, U of T. So uh, please come and visit and, uh, and find other opportunities for collaboration. Uh, and if anyone has a good picture of Raven that I can replace the <laughs> sketch, uh, there are reasons that he chooses not to put his photo online a lot, and if you, if you know the story, if not, you can ask him. All right, so uh, there are a bunch of things that we've played at in Toronto, and one of the things that we do as faculty members, of course, is uh, enable students to go off and do really cool and exciting work, and then every once in a while come and give talks, and look back at all the work and try to put them into what you can call projects to make it look like you were gifted with foresight for all of this. Uh, wonderful stuff. So this is my sort of post hoc characterization of the work that we do in my group. Uh, we play a lot in post-WIMP uh, user experience, uh, the symphony of devices building on uh, the society of devices ideas. Uh, we do digital fabrication, immersive haptics, zero latency user interface uh, stuff, although that's now mostly spun out uh, as a company, and uh, now more recently looking at emerging technologies in developing nations. But in particular, uh, Ken asked me to focus on the Symphony of Devices work that we've been doing over the last few years. So in this talk, I'm going to be compressing a whole bunch of Kai and Wist papers uh, into one sort of you know, bite-sized uh, chunk. And of course, along the way, I'll be presenting the work that was done by a whole lot of really smart and talented people uh, who are represented here on the slide from U of T, uh, Microsoft, uh, there's this handsome devil here, uh, Autodesk Research, although now uh, Toby Grossman has joined us as a faculty member in Toronto, uh, and Anthony Chen, uh, who was at CMU when he, we collaborated, and now he's a professor at UCLA. Uh, so um, these are the various folks who've contributed to the symphony. And what's really exciting to me about multi-device, although we've been, uh, we as a community have been looking at multi-device interactions for decades, and, uh, and looking at great opportunities for how we can move information between devices, what are the experiences to move information between devices, what are the opportunities that get created. We find ourselves now in the world at an interesting time in terms of the potential for those HCI visions to become reality. So here's a, a great couple of slides that Anthony had in his Kai talk. So we have the papal conclave for Benedict XVI in 2005. So, Here's a photo of uh, the people gathered to wait for the white smoke, right, to, to find out who the pope is going to be. And then just eight years later, we have another papal conclave for uh, Pope Francis, and here's a photo of that. <laughs> so we see a pretty startling contrast between those two times. And of course, you think about what's happened since 2005, we get the introduction of, of true smartphones, right, that actually are computers rather than things that are pretending to be computers. We get tablet PCs, we get lithium ion battery cells produced in mass quantities, we get mobile devices, uh, we get ARM processors, and we have the ability to have these mobile devices, and people genuinely now do have multiple devices, right? So we're not quite at this point yet, but we're definitely getting to a point where we have this opportunity where people have these things in their pockets. Now, uh, Bill is very fond of saying that the way we want to think about devices in the future is like this, right? It's a stack of paper. 
the way we think about uh, an iPad today is that it's an expensive and valuable piece of technology. The way we can think about it in the future is it'll be like a piece of paper. Is that a fair characterization of things that you've said? It's all from Mark Weiser, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're driving towards that future. And one of the interesting realizations that comes from Park and Mark Weiser and uh, some of that work is a recognition that just because it's cheap and it's paper doesn't mean that you're not going to have different form factors, right? And different devices have natural affordances for different uses of the technology. So what we're interested in doing in our work is looking at how can all of these things come together and be used together uh, in, uh, in interesting and useful ways. And we build on these notions of the society of devices, and we've dubbed this the symphony of devices. And I'll explain a little bit why uh, we've done that as the, the talk sort of progresses. But if you think about what are all of the technologies that people have available to them, and I'm realizing I should update this slide because uh, this is the version of the talk I gave a few years ago. So, you know, smartwatches don't look like that anymore and your surface tables don't look like that anymore. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, lots of screens available to us, right? And what we're interested in looking at is enabling people and answering this question, how can we enable users to dynamically form ad hoc arrangements of devices to suit their current needs? Now, when I've given this talk in industry contexts, uh, I've heard back from people, well, doesn't Apple do this already? Doesn't Google do this already? Because we have things like iCloud. Well, what iCloud can enable right now uh, is this vision, right? And this is a screenshot from a while ago, as you can tell by the old iPhone. This is largely what iCloud does. I can buy my Beatles album on my phone, and then I can download it onto my other devices. It's about, it's about synchronizing states so that I can transition between devices. So we're starting to get to that idea that it doesn't matter what the device is and what matters is the content, but we're not yet getting to this idea of the ad hoc uh, connections. Same for Microsoft. Uh, this isn't called SkyDrive anymore. Now it's called OneDrive. OneDrive. Sorry. Oh, really? This yeah, is the result yeah, of a lawsuit? Oh, OK. All right. I just thought it was, you know, another group took over another group. And... All right, well, anyway. So the vision for OneDrive is sort of similar, right? It originally, back when this slide was created, it was about taking content from your individual device. You put it in the cloud, and then I can access it on another device. And I did that with the PowerPoint presentation. I've got my desktop computer at home, and then I you know, plugged in my laptop, and the PowerPoint was already on it when I was going to the car, which is fabulous. And, and it also does things like I can synchronize editing of a document with multiple people, and it's sort of getting to the Google Docs sort of vision, right? But most of the functionality and most of how it's getting used is about enabling people to transition from one device to another. So we not see, we do not see yet these platforms enabling people to use the devices together to enable compelling experiences. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Uh, Netflix does something similar, uh, right? You can watch a movie on your phone on the bus, and when you get home, you can switch to your, your TV, your laptop, whatever. Uh, I'm told that someone has developed a Netflix app where you can use the phone as a remote control. So that's sort of getting there. Uh, but it isn't built in, it isn't baked into the Netflix app experience. Kindle, same thing, right? I can read my book on my phone and switch to my thing and the state is synced. But it's all about moving between devices rather than enabling devices uh, to work together in an interesting way. So, whoops. You are multiple devices. I am multiple devices. <laughs> Uh, that's a PowerPoint bug for any, you know, I'm sure the whole PowerPoint team is watching. So uh, we think about this model, right? We have individual devices, we sync content to the cloud. That's not what we want. What we want is applications that just span devices. And yeah, maybe it's facilitated by the cloud, although, you know, how good an idea is that? How truly reliable is your internet connection for real-time interaction? But sure, it's facilitated by the cloud, right? Uh, but what we want is to enable people to sort of span multiple devices. So a lot of people have done sort of roomware type work. Uh, so for example, here's a project I did uh, during my PhD called uh, WeSpace. And in the WeSpace, I'm sorry, I have audio and it's not coming out. I'll just narrate myself. Oh, there we go. And connect to a server with a lightweight client. And share their screen images on a high resolution data wall. Each laptop screen on the table is rendered with a control bar with buttons that allow users to switch the priority of the image. These images are automatically laid out based on the priority of each display. 
Users are also free to manually manage the layout on both the table and wall surfaces. Gestural input on the table controls the magnification and placement of the laptop images on both the table and the wall. So uh, the WeSpace project, again, was a, is about a room, right? You could come into this room, and when you're in the room, you can have your laptop stuff sent into the room, and you can use the table to do stuff with it. And other people have built these sort of smart rooms also. Uh, but it's a static environment. So this, too, isn't the sort of ad hoc connection forming that I'm talking about, and it certainly isn't enabling people to uh, easily transition between combinations of devices for what they need. So let me show you an example of something that we built. Uh, there'll be a video uh, that I'm about to play from 2014 uh, showing someone named Robert Levy, who used to work here at Microsoft. I think many of you may know him, or some of you may know him. Uh, building what we, or showing what uh, we called then the conductor project. I'm showing a clip of a video where he describes how PowerPoint might work with a more symphonic vision of multi-device interaction. So here's Robert. For example, here we've got this PowerPoint type of application where we've got the slide, the slide list, the speaker notes, and the timer down at the bottom. If I connect in, sign into the same application on my mobile phone, then what we'll see happen as I sign in is that the slide list, the speaker notes, and the timer will jump over to my phone off of the laptop. And this happens not because the application was coded specifically to say that these features should appear on the phone and the current slide should appear on the laptop. In fact, the way the application was set up is to say it happens to have a feature that is the current slide. The current slide would like to be uh, on the largest screen available and it would like to be by itself. Uh, and based on that, our algorithms figured out, okay, here's the two available devices. This one's optimal for the current slide. Everything else can go here. Uh, it gets more complicated though when you have a larger number of devices or more variety of devices. So for example, down here, I've got the slide timer on my phone, um, which is neat. That's a good thing to have on my phone when it's acting as a remote control. But if I happen to have a smartwatch, uh, we can run the conductor application on the smartwatch and we'll see the timer jump off of my phone and onto the watch. So now on my watch, it's telling me what slide number I'm on, how long we've been on the current slide, how long the presentation has been going in total. And it's not a dumb display, just like we can control the slides from the, the phone is remote control, we can actually push the buttons on the watch and have it update what slide we're on uh, across all of these devices, move forwards and backwards. We can actually go farther than that. I can add in my, my glasses, and if I, if I connect into the same application, I've logged into my glasses, uh, what we'll see happen is that the speaker notes uh, will disappear from the phone, and the speaker notes will then appear uh, directly on my glasses, so I have a nice private teleprompter um, in my peripheral vision. So now what we've seen is that the speaker notes have disappeared. All right, so uh, that was the, the sort of more refined version, the culmination of a bunch of the work we were doing in terms of both user experience uh, and developer experience. We put those to, oh my gosh, PowerPoint. I swear I'm clicking on a different slide than the one it's choosing to show you. All right, there we go. So we put all of that together into what we call the symphony of devices. And what we're trying to tackle in this project is sort of two pieces. One uh, certainly is the user experience, right? The sort of classical HCI questions of what are the arrangements of devices that provide useful, usable, desirable experiences for end users? Yes. Uh, and I'll talk a, a fair bit about that also. But the other problem that we got really interested in uh, was how can we enable content producers to target unknown device combinations? Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that, but, but as you're sitting there, and I'm going to go through a bunch of the HCI now and some of the underlying studies now, what I want you to be thinking about as a computer scientist or an engineer, how would you build an application that could enable the experiences that I'm going to show you without knowing in advance what are the devices that this is going to be running on, what combinations of devices will be there? And just think about what tools and toolkits you might need to enable that, and then we'll, we'll get to the end and we'll talk about developer experience. All right, so uh, three pieces I want to tell you about. I'll, I'll show you quickly a piece of ethnographic research that we did that sort of kicked all of this off. Uh, then we'll talk about interaction design, and then we'll talk about tool uh, development. So first into the ethnography. Uh, so this paper was first published at UBComp back in 2013. Uh, and what we did, or what Stephanie did, was uh, went and examined 
how are people today using multiple devices in combination with each other? Uh, or, you know, substitute 2013 for today, right? But 2013 was already late enough that there were good cloud services to synchronize content across devices. It wasn't all that hard to send files from one place to another to, or to uh, send uh, contacts and synchronize uh, calendars and that sort of thing across devices. We'd gotten past having to synchronize using like cradles. If you think back to the old Palm Pilots, the way that you had to sync, there was no internet connection, right? So you had to put it on the cradle on your desk and hit the sync button. This is later than all of that, right? This is sort of cloud-enabled synchronization of stuff. And what we want to understand was how, given the tools that were available at that time, are people using multiple devices? So she went out into the world and recruited 22 participants. Uh, here is a sort of a snapshot uh, of the sorts of people we have. So we have, for example, a motion designer, an interior designer, a uh, neurophysiologist, a hospital pharmacist, a uh, management consultant, and so on. So these are professionals who use professional grade tools. And she sat and interviewed and worked with them and performed the sort of basic first steps of ethnography to understand what are the things that you're doing today. So in terms of breakdown of industry, we have everything from creatives to engineers, health, uh, IT, business marketing, consulting, et cetera. So we have 22 participants, uh, and we went and collected all this information. And so here are a few of the highlights. So for example, here's a photograph of a desk, uh, and we see you know, papers uh, that are in this sort of desk space love these photos, right? And I love this photo a lot, and I think it's pretty illustrative for a couple of reasons. One, so look at this workplace. We have this sort of you know, Jonathan Gruden multi-monitor type setup, right, where people are trying to align the monitor. One of the things that's really interesting to me about that is that all of it is being driven from a laptop, right? So this is, uh, we're seeing a transition between you know, when, when I unplug that laptop and go home, all the information is sort of automatically synchronized between these setups because there is no synchronization. It's just all the state is on the laptop itself, right? What else is happening here? Well, you see the keyboard and mouse and monitor is fine and all that's plugged into the laptop. We see also an iPad uh, that this person is using concurrently. And I think just as interestingly, we also see a whole bunch of paper uh, that this person is using concurrently as well. And uh, in particular, we see this journal taking up the prominent middle spot of the workspace, right? And the keyboard is sort of shoved aside uh, for, uh, for the journal. So that's sort of interesting, right, in terms of multiple devices. And in our work, we consider these paper artifacts to be peers to the digital devices. So we, we call them all artifacts uh, together in the study. Uh, here's another workspace uh, that, uh, that we see. A couple of interesting things. First of all, we see two sets of mice and keyboards so there are at least two computers that are being driven by this thing, probably. Uh, or sorry, that are driving all of, all of this stuff. Uh, here again, we also see an iPad uh, that's part of the active work, right? So this is not in keeping with the visions I set before of the mobile devices for mobile time, you use it on the bus. The desktop is for desktop time, you use it in your office. Here they're using it all concurrently. Here's another workspace of one of the uh, designers. And we see here, splayed out on the desk, all being used concurrently. Uh, or relatively concurrently, laptop, phone, tablet. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is someone who is in a co-working space. And in this instance, uh, we see a phone that's sitting on the desk and part of the workspace. But we also see this uh, Wacom tablet. Now, a computer scientist engineer looks at that and says, well, that's not a separate device, right? That's just an input device for the computer. But if you th the way I want you to think about these things is, don't think about what CPU happens to be driving these things, right? Like what we're focused on is, what are the artifacts, the physical things that this person is interacting with? The fact that they all happen to be driven by the same core is sort of irrelevant, right? So what's interesting here is, uh, they've chosen to designate uh, an, an input space to that input device and still have the other input devices that are sort of built into the laptop, right? And this is in a co-working space. So this is, you know, they carry this around with them in their laptop bag and set it up. Okay? This is in the permanent setup. So uh, just to give you the sort of the quick high-level view of the paper, and then I'll point you to the paper for all the sort of detailed stuff, uh, Stephanie performed a detailed artifact analysis, and this is a couple of dozen pages that's an appendix to the paper you can download that shows every single artifact, and artifact here includes the, uh, the particular laptops, it also includes the physical notebooks and all of those things. And then we talk about uh, what are all of the different uh, things that these get used for, how do they transition information in and out of them, and how does it fit together. So that, that sort of raw data is there, and we've found it extremely useful to go back and mine this over the last six years so that when I have students who are interested in creating multi-device experiences and want to say, you know, what, what should we use this stuff for, 
We'll actually go back and look at these tables and say, well, you know, here we see that there was this professional who tried to create this scenario. It's completely unsupported by the tools. Let's focus on that, right? So we pulled out a bunch of projects from this. I think sort of interestingly in terms of the analysis I'll pull out and focus on in particular in this longer talk, uh, we also, Stephanie also produced these landscape diagrams for each user to talk about how are all of the uh, devices or rather the artifacts linked together. So what are the cloud services that link them together and what are the task flows that link them together? And so we see uh, built into some of these things tools, of course, like Dropbox and uh, Google Drive, uh, Evernote, Gmail. Uh, the presence of an email in the middle of this cloud is sort of interesting, right? It shows that people are still uh, emailing things to themselves. They can open it on a different computer. And just as a quick straw poll, as you sit here today, who in the last week, month, let's call it two months, has emailed a file to themselves so that they can open it on a different device. All right. And Microsoft has a tool to enable this stuff, right? OK. I actually have OneDrive installed on all of my devices, and I love it. I use it a lot. But I, too, still email stuff to myself all the fast. time, right? It's absolutely fast. It's reliable. You know it'll synchronize, right? Uh, people were doing it then. People are still doing it. What's that? Email gives you versioning. Email gives you an ability to search on things other than the document itself. Uh, and its position relative to other things in the email log is something that your memory tends to be good at latching onto. Yeah, absolutely. All those things. It's, it's incredibly valuable. Yeah. And of course, transaction costs. When mobile, you get the OneDrive, it's a pain in the ass. It takes way more time. So if you look at the transaction cost, it's, it's much, much uh, more efficient. Yeah. So it's a better tool. Yeah, absolutely. It's better. Right? Well, OneDrive does give you version. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's very important. Does it do version? Yep. Yes, yes. Yep. Is right. for large so, so, yeah, you can get the version, right? But it's, it's as, as the point here being, of course, it's built into the email, right? I see it in yeah. the date, I see it in the subject line, it gets tagged. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, let's dive into the details of this in a little bit. Um, but uh, anyway, so we, we all have these sorts of cross-device behaviors. What are the sort of interesting things that I might choose to pull out? So uh, let's see. Here's another uh, landscape, right? So this is another participant, and we see all of the connections between devices. Do you notice anything sort of interesting about this image? Hmm? Delete the MacBook. <laughs> I heard someone mention connections. They're islands. The other one is yeah. Oh, islands. Graph. Yeah. This one is a... We have, we have sort of two connected graphs, right? So here we have a completely connected graph. Whoops. There we have this sort of disconnection, right? And uh, maybe not surprisingly for some, this is because they have the sort of professional devices and their personal devices completely segmented. And different companies have different policies on this stuff. Do you guys carry around different phones at Microsoft? Do you... No, you're not. Yeah. Uh, hmm? No. Okay. Depends um, we have a two-sim phone. I see. All right. Fair oh, enough. All I got is so uh, this paper has a whole bunch of these diagrams. You can go back and mine it for a whole bunch of experiences, and I think it's sort of interesting for that reason. Um, so they're just a little bit of the analysis that you can see we have. Uh, we examined all of the patterns of information flow that people uh, practiced in their work. And we found that there were both serial and parallel patterns. So we call a serial pattern this sort of, you know, I do one thing and then I do the other like the Netflix. But people are doing parallel patterns as well. And I think if you sort of reflect on your own experience, you'll recognize this. So for example, who has ever had their phone sitting on their desk uh, running a calculator app while they're doing something else on their desktop computer? Okay. So we see, all, we see this behavior all the time in ourselves, and we found it in the wild as well, where people are trying to do these multi-device parallel experiences but the annoying thing, uh, at least as of 2013, was you can do your calculation on your calculator, but you can't take the result and paste it into your desktop computer. There, there are actually apps now that will synchronize the clipboards across devices. Uh, if you don't have one, it might make your life better. But, but we've, we have these sort of islands that get created in terms of our digital connectivity for all kinds of reasons. Uh, we also talk about, in the paper, how people specialize their devices and tools based on the use cases. So certainly things like people use their phones uh, for things the phone is good for, like a calculator, because it's, it, they can dedicate a screen to it, uh, those sorts of uh, realizations. Then we also talk about all the problems of data fragmentation, suggestions how to fix all of this stuff. So I'll refer you to the paper to get to those results, but 
Uh, before we get to the sort of fun HCI stuff, I always like to sort of highlight those results because I think it's very useful for people who are looking to, to practice in this area. It's a fun paper. One of my favorite, just as like an example, one of my favorite parallel patterns that we saw was uh, people using devices as helpers for each other. So there was an architect who would do site visits, and when he was on site, he, wouldn't, he couldn't see things properly, so he would launch the camera application that would synchronize to his tablet, and then hold his phone up like this, and then look at his tablet to see what his uh, phone was displaying. And he had sort of figured out how to do this with the, the calendar app that would synchronize across devices. But I like that example for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's showing the creativity of users to use applications for things that are completely different than what they're intended for. He's not actually taking pictures. He's just using it as a periscope. But two, we're also seeing how uh, the, the, the fact that this app had that functionality to use one device as a viewfinder certainly wasn't built to support this scenario. But uh, if applications bake into themselves the ability to uh, break apart and let users choose which devices they want to use for different functionality at any given moment, then, then we're able to see these sorts of things emerge. Right? So the application developers don't have to uh, focus necessarily on all of the um, snares it's going to get used for. All right, so there's a lot more in that paper, but I'll jump ahead. Let's talk about the interaction design stuff. So we built on top of the interaction design work, and I'll show you uh, three different projects uh, that, that applied some of this stuff. The first was something called Conductor. It was published at CHI in 2014. And the vision behind Conductor was that we wanted to enable people to have multiple devices, uh, phones, tablets, and to uh, use them in any way that they chose to uh, for their application. So uh, if you can imagine the, the desktop surface going from this some number of decades ago to this some smaller number of decades ago uh, to the laptop to the phone. How do we get back to something that enables people to uh, have the original experience that was more in keeping with uh, our behaviors? So this is our vision, is large number of devices, people can form ad hoc connections and use them in combination. So here's Peter, who's the author of the paper, uh, using our system. And we built the uh, application that underlaid all of this uh, around a document triage and information foraging task so that people would have a, a use for uh, multiple devices. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute when I get to the validation. But there's the system. Let me get to some of the details. So the conductor paper talks about multiple applications. We built it as separate apps, but then enabled frameworks to sort of move uh, between those applications and to enable users to form connections themselves rather than forcing developers to think in advance about what are all of the different connections that a user might want to, uh, to make. So let me take you through some conductor applications. So this uh, first app I'm going to show you is an application that lists tourist destinations in a city. So this might be built by a uh, uh, business association. You might think of it as the results from a Google Map search. You know. So here are a bunch of locations in Toronto. And in the single application version of this thing, if I tap on a particular output, I get information about that destination. Right? This, is, this is sort of a very, very basic show me the cool stuff in a city app that you might run on your phone. So how now might this extend to a scenario where I have not just a phone but also a tablet? So we've got our uh, original phone on the left and now a Nexus on the right. And of course, the Nexus display is much more suited to uh, viewing detailed information and viewing photos. But as we've found from our ethnographic work, we know that people like to be able to maintain the context of the list at the same time. And so we enable the information to flow. So what do we see? How do we transfer it? So there are a couple of different ways we can do this. One, we enable users to do what we call targeted transmission. So targeted transmission, the idea is I have a device, and I've got another device, and I, on my original device, say, all right, I want to send information to that thing over there. Right? Sort of like the uh, send to another application functionality or the share button on the iPhone or an Android. Right? So it's sort of user initiated the moment that you're sending the information out. So we can send a command like this. So the user can scroll through a list, find the thing they want, 
uh, choose that they want to send it from a Pi menu, and then see all of the available devices that they can choose to send it to, and then they release and it'll send the information to that device. So here it is uh, in action. So there's the phone. They'll find uh, this historical figure they want to send information to, and they choose the particular device uh, to send it along. Now, one of the things that is sort of interesting for the designer in this application, like this is pretty basic, right? This is sort of like the share button from the iPhone built into multiple applications. One of the things, though, that's really interesting are the bumpers around these devices. Does anyone notice anything about all the bumpers on those? They're Say? They're color coordinated. They're color coordinated, exactly right. Because we ran into this problem very, very quickly that when you have 15 tablets on your table, it becomes impossible to identify which tablet you're going to send information to. Now, of course, Ken has published things that you, know, you can bump them together, or use pen strokes and that sort of thing to, to use the physical location of the devices relative to each other. Uh, but we didn't want to, uh, anyway, we wanted to explore another, problem, another space. So, uh, so we bought these colored bumpers and then registered the color in, in the system. Okay. Uh, in addition to targeting devices, we can also broadcast because uh, although in, the, in many scenarios you want to be able to say, you know, send it to device X, in a single user scenario, if, you're, if I say I want to enable someone to send to a device of their choice, I don't want them to have to sort of choose from a menu based on the color, can I instead try to invoke some of the work that, uh, that Ken did where I can sort of engage the other physical device in it we came to this realization, well, yeah, we can, and we can sort of do it like this, and it won't be as annoying as you think. So let's take a look. Just like you do with Windows. So check this out. So I broadcast the thing out, right? And when I broadcast it out, the queue goes to every device in the symphony. If you have 100 devices, then this thing shows up on 100 devices at the same time. That sounds like it would be really annoying, right? Except this is a single user scenario. So if the user is only on uh, one device at a time, the, where their eyes happen to be pointing is the place that they want to send the information. So they get that cue uh, on the device, and they can just tap it. And if they tap it, then it just loads the sort of default behavior. Uh, and it's minimally invasive for the reason that I said, because of the eye focus. Okay. So once you tap it on one device, does it disappear from all of the other ones? Uh, in our implementation, it did not immediately disappear from all the others for reasons that I'll show in a minute so that we can form multiple connections. That's the other reason we want to broadcast. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we can do is when you grab the, uh, yeah, sorry, there we go. There's the feedback. We can also have these contextual associations. So here, instead of just tapping, I dragged it over into the browser that was already open in the screen. And in that instance, instead of loading up the page of the application, Right, if I had tapped, it would load this, another instance of this app and load up the, in, the page that came from here. Instead, I was already running a web browser, so I dragged the queue over, and it recognized the, the browser recognized the type of information that would be useful to it and loaded up a web page that described it, and that's because there was a URL uh, embedded in the, in the um, tag, in the queue. So here's the queue running. So this is the a context list example. You see it'll broadcast and come across on all these other devices. So there he tapped to load up the sort of default page. Then he's going to broadcast out the address, and he happens to be running Google Maps on one of the tablets, so it loads up the person's address in that Google Maps app. Okay, so from this, we get some fairly powerful behavior because we do late coupling of the information to the uh, application the user chooses to send it to, sort of like the Android intent framework, so that you can say, what is the type of information and how am I able to consume it at that moment? Right? So it isn't all decided a priori. Okay. Uh, we also can enable uh, using the, the uh, phone as a remote control by creating l persistent links between the applications. So instead of just sending information from one place to the other, you can choose to form this uh, bond, which we call a duet. So you can form a functional bond instead of just sending information so that when the queue uh, comes, we broadcast it out, you grab the uh, object and drag it into the link receptor. And once you form a link, 
every time there's a change in behavior in the original device, it broadcasts out the new information. And based on which application was receiving it, will show the appropriate information. Right? So in that instance, uh, it was the default application. So it actually launched an instance of the same app. So that when I tapped on the Eaton Center, I get the Eaton Center display of this application. But instead of replacing this screen, it shows it on that screen instead. But I can also form other types of links. So here, for example, are two map displays. And in the map, we have two different types of links. So the first link, the first target that he dragged to on the top of the list on the right, just synchronizes the displays. So every time one display updates, it updates the other. Now in a moment, what you'll see is he'll bring up the list of links again. He'll pull it off and move it down to another receptor to instead just receive the display information, but it uses it in a different way. It's now showing what is the view area of the other display on this display. So what's interesting about this, if you think about the sort of developer uh, an application developer experience, I as an application developer can say, I as an app am capable of being linked to other applications using this, using the conductor framework. The types of information I can receive are this, 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 and this, right? So in this instance, it's receiving geographical information or it's receiving screen coordinates or whatever, and those types can be defined using sort of like a classic MIME type definition. Again, this is sounding a lot like the Android intent framework for those of you who've worked with it. But the other thing that I can do is I define multiple behaviors. So I can say, yes, I can receive geographic information, but I'll, I can choose to do with it actions A, B, or C. I can choose to, whenever I receive geographic information, I can zoom the map and show it on the screen, or instead I can choose to display a Wikipedia page about it, or I can choose to do this, uh, some other action. And at the time that I'm developing, the application developer just specifies what are the types of information I can receive, what are the behaviors I can link it to, and then provide the user with the option to decide which of those sockets we want to permanently connect this into, to link to. So that the user can make that decision and do that binding at the time that they're running the application. But I don't need to know what are all the types of applications that I can connect to. Right? I don't need to know that I might be getting geographic information from this maps application, I might be getting geographic information from a website or a web uh, browser, but right? I just define the information type. Yeah. Right shows from UI to uh, do the selection on the application that sends the information. Wouldn't it be more uh, logical that the application that gets it will say what it does with it? So there are two pieces of information that need to get specified by the user. Okay, so let me clarify. This is a great question. So the question was, why from an HCI standpoint, from a UX standpoint, is the sending application specifying how it's going to get used? Okay. Uh, it's a little bit different from that. What happens is, when I'm broadcasting information, I choose what information to send and I choose what aspect of that information to send. Right? So if I say that I was back in the contacts information, I choose a contact, and I could say I want you to send the photo, or I want you to send the address. Right? So I'm choosing what type of information am I going to send out. Once that gets specified in the original uh, device, then at receive time, I can say, OK, I know that the information I'm receiving is of type whatever. It's, a, it's an address. Here are the behaviors that I can perform against that address. Okay? So we're, we're, it's sort of a split decision. Okay? So first it's the type, then it's how you act on it. And this is sort of like sharing in iOS or Android, right, where you specify, I want to share this out. And based on the type of the information, and I keep mentioning the Android intent framework. Has anyone here worked with the Android intent framework? Do you know what I'm talking about? A, a few. OK. Just quickly, yeah. this is sounding a lot like small time. Yes. An object and message passing. So could you frame it that, that some of us are more familiar with that? Than maybe yeah, sure. So. The, the, this idea of being able to pass information from one application to another, it, uh, it, it's present in Smalltalk. I, I, I've never developed against Smalltalk. I want to focus on the DevX. But, but the point is, this sort of late binding of information type gets carried forward all the way through Mac, Windows, right? I can specify what is the type of information. It's manifest in the MIME types. And this is how uh, I can choose what application gets opened when I double click an app, right? Or in my web browser, it specifies which player should I load when I've got a piece of information coming in. 
The difference here is I'm giving the power to the user at the time by splitting up this information type and letting them choose, am I just acting on it once or am I forming a persistent connection between this source and that destination? Okay, so I get it. So, but now we're actually into some classic problems from operating systems. And so synchronized and parallel processes or objects. And so you've got contention on all these issues. So you can message passing it's like, are you using port type monitors, P and V? How are you avoiding deadlock, especially because they have distributed devices? You don't, you shouldn't assume they're single users. So in, uh, in this project, so the, your, your question is, what is the underlying framework that we built all this yeah. against? And how are we avoiding? Yeah. So in this instance, we're using just a classic broadcast. So it, we're not experiencing deadlock because they're, I mean, I guess you, the user could perhaps form a situation where deadlock would occur by creating a cycle between the devices. Okay, so we, we have not, uh, we don't have a block for that. The user can get themselves into trouble. And your assumption is a single user? This particular framework is single user, yes. Okay. So that, the, that's and, our target. And it's not extensible? Uh, the concepts are potentially extensible. This framework was to allow us to explore HCI issues. I got it. Yeah, okay. All right, so what else do we have? Uh, so I've talked about being able to form these device, uh, cross-device duets. We also have the sort of uh, classic task manager. We replace the Android task manager uh, so that when I call it up on any given device, I see not just the applications that are running on this device, but I see a display of the applications running on all devices, and I can grab an application and move it from one device to another, for example. Uh, and this has been implemented in all kinds of uh, multi-device. Do you have use, say, 10 tab uh, tablets, but you input to one at a time? Yes. Why not, instead of lifting and putting, lifting and putting, have a selection, which I tap here and I tap here. now is your input? Let me, let me show you an example of that in about five minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we were, this gave us uh, a, a perfectly fine way of characterizing it is the multi-device version of uh, information passing in an operating system, fine. What this enabled us to do was one, explore the user experience, but two, understand, are people actually going to use this when it's made available to them? So we ran a study, I won't take you through all the details, but just be aware that it's there, uh, if you're curious. And this was based on uh, a previous piece of work, where'd it go, Space to Think, where uh, Chris North and two of his students wanted to ask the question, if you had very large multi-display multi environments with a single device, would people actually use all of this real estate and how would they use it? Uh, so we adapted their experiment to answer a similar question of if you have all of these devices, are you going to use them? Uh, and they and we took the vast 2000, 2006 contest data set, which essentially is, let's see, do I have the numbers? Yeah, 230 documents presenting to you a fictional uh, thing that has happened in a small town, uh, including newspaper reports and that sort of thing, and you as the participant have to go through and sort of solve the mystery of what's going on uh, in that town. So this is a classic methodology that we're choosing to apply, but we were interested to see would people use all of these devices when it was made available to them. So, uh, did they use it? Well, yes, as it turns out. So we provided people with uh, multiple tablets, we told them their goal was to solve the problem, not necessarily to use multiple tablets, but we still found that they exhibited all the sort of classic messy desk type behaviors of using the physical arrangement of the devices to store information. So for example, uh, if there's a particularly important document or document I think is important, I'll take it and sort of put it in a different spot on my desk as an important thing to remember for later. They would save indices, they would have like an inbox and an outbox. We saw all of these sort of behaviors. Uh, and they actually did choose to uh, use multiple devices right through to the end of the experiment, and all the details are there. So that was sort of our first uh, multi-device project. Now, in parallel to that, uh, conducted at Autodesk Research, I collaborated with uh, George and Toby and Anthony Chen. And in the conductor project, we called the formation of these persistent connections between devices duets. So this idea is the user can choose to form a persistent operational connection between devices. And we wanted to go deep uh, uh, a little bit and to explore how could a smartwatch and a phone in particular be used together to enhance interaction. So going deep into this space, so here are a few examples. 
So here we're using the smartwatch to detect uh, gestures on the wrist, so you can flip your wrist around to bring up a different type of menu. We're also using it to detect how you're giving input. So if you're using a fingertip, then you get a pen. If you're using the side of your finger, you get scrolling behavior. If you tap with your knuckle, you get highlighting. And that's all based on the IMU in the, uh, in the watch to detect the gestures. Uh, we also have things like uh, shared clipboard information, so we can use the, device, the watch as a secondary display uh, and as a tool palette so that people can uh, use the devices in concert. Uh, and of course, this predates the Apple Watch, so this is sort of a very, very early color uh, capacitive uh, watch with an API. And side effects, if you gain a bit of uh, screen space, wouldn't that be faster if those four buttons were at the bottom of the phone? Uh, would it be faster if the four buttons were in the bottom of the phone? Yes, probably. Uh, I think an undoubtedly. I think what, one of the things that's really interesting about display bezels, and Jonathan talks about this in his paper from, well, a while ago. Uh, so Jonathan Gruden, of, uh, you should all know, is here. Uh, he, he did a project that looked at developers who have multiple monitors on their desk, and these are professional developers, I think at Microsoft, uh, and looked at how do people actually use multiple monitors. And one of my favorite results from that project was he talked about the value of the bezels and the fact that people would choose to use the displays uh, to organize information and would not choose to sort of stretch information across displays. Now, when you first read the paper, you think, okay, well, maybe that's just because the window manager does it, right? Like when you click maximize, it fills one monitor and not two monitors, right? Although I think back then, I'm not sure it was actually smart enough to only fill one monitor. But if you, if you read more deeply into the results, he talks about this idea that uh, people like to categorize information with full screen displays. So they can say, this is my monitor for task X and this is my monitor for task Y. So to answer your question, yes, having the tool palette on your wrist it does not increase performance. It does increase the number of pixels we make available to the user on their display, and it's applying some of those Gruden principles to it. Um, so we talked about, or I talked a moment ago about being able to detect different gestures uh, with the smartwatch. Uh, and there's a really cool Kai paper, if you haven't seen it, uh, this past year that Chris Harrison, one of his students, did that builds on some of this stuff using the uh, uh, off-the-shelf smartwatch to detect uh, gestures uh, in the wild. Um, we also see, we do a few different things that are interesting, like we've, I showed you the tool palette example. We also, again, uh, are focused on enabling people to choose how they want to use their devices. So for example, if you have, one of the problems that people have with having a lot of devices is all the notifications. Right? When, I'm, when I'm giving my sort of live demos, and I have 15 tablets in my bag, and it wants to remind me the demo happens, you know, people think the world is coming to an end, right? Because Outlook is dinging on all my devices. So, uh, so for example, if you want to be able to mute or send the audio to one device or another, uh, we provide a set of gestures that you can do that. So if you want to silence all devices, you sort of pinch them together to get rid of the sound, or pinch apart to distribute the sound to all devices, uh, or perform the sort of cross-device gesture, similar to Ken's uh, work, to send the sound from one device to another and that sort of thing. So in that paper, we go into a lot of detail. Uh, what I like most about that project uh, is the framework that I think is really useful. So I won't go into a lot more detail about all the interactions, although there are a lot of really cool uh, things that the team develops there that, I've, uh, that if you're interested, you should take a look at. But I point people to this framework a lot to think about design spaces for applications and for multi-device. Uh, so we looked at, the way we conceptualized it was, if you have multiple devices, you might think of one as being the foreground device and one being the background device at any given time. So for example, if the watch is the background device and the, the phone is the foreground device, I can just use the watch to do things like gesture detection, the example I just gave you a moment ago. If it's the other way around, then uh, we see totally different behavior, right? So phone, background, watch, foreground. Both, back, uh, both background is, there actually are some interactions there, both foreground uh, and one foreground. So what's interesting here, uh, so for example, watch foreground and phone foreground, we see things like uh, being able to detect users' postures of how they're uh, wearing the watch. So we had different gestures based on whether you were wearing the watch on the bottom of the wrist or the top of your wrist uh, to do things like the tool palette display while I'm holding my phone and that sort of thing. Uh, we could detect uh, those things. Uh, in addition to that, we also enable people to do things like switch layers, so we see uh, having, oh, that's not playing. Yeah, 
So here, if the watch is sort of around the back and you can't see it, there aren't a lot of things you can do with it because you can't uh, see the display to give direct touch input, but we can switch layers just by performing a gesture. Or here, when it's on uh, the front of your wrist, then it differentiates uh, the behavior. We can also see things like doing task management to switch applications. So a lot of these sort of one-off uh, experiences. But what all of this is in aid of, if I sort of jump forward a little bit, um, what all of this is in aid of is to try to solve the developer experience problem. Now, I'll, I'll show one last project. Maybe I'll just show the video uh, to make sure I've got time to show the DevX stuff. This is something we just presented at Kai. We wanted to ask the question, so we talk, you know, it's talked a lot about how, what if a device is as cheap as paper. One of the ways you can make a device as cheap as paper is just to use paper. So uh, here we have a HoloLens providing the digital uh, display. Uh, it's really nice when you use the sort of third person view instead of the actual HoloLens because now the view area is the entire display. So your actual user experience, uh, it's not quite that you get to see all of this at the same time if you haven't worn a HoloLens. But uh, in that research project, uh, we built an application where I could read physical research papers and then get all kinds of meta information and find connections between them and that gets shown as digital information. So for example, uh, if there's a reference that I want information about, I can tap on the reference on the paper using my pen. It recognizes the reference, looks it up, and shows the, the reference paper there. Uh, you can play the video of the video figures and that sort of thing associated with different sections of the paper. Okay? So that, that was the last uh, user experience piece. I think all of this, of course, as I've said, is to enable us to answer what I think of as maybe the more interesting problem which is how can content producers target unknown device combinations? This to me, this is what we've spent most of our time trying to solve. So I'll show you one, oh my gosh, PowerPoint. <laughs> it really likes my ID Very photos. Huh? It's showing a different ID photo when yeah. I click on different parts of this talk. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so this is pan Panorama, it was presented a few years ago at, at Kai. Uh, and the problem we're trying to solve is, has previously been called write once, run everywhere. So we didn't coin this term, of course, and you may recognize our friend from the, the Java world over there. But many, many people have tried to solve this problem generally of how do I write an application once and it runs across all computers, right? And this is the, the purpose of virtualization and, uh, and just really the purpose of the web in a lot of ways now. But our problem is a little bit different from this because the write once, run everywhere problems that were previously trying to be solved was how can I write an application that will run on a phone or on a tablet or on a laptop, right? What we're trying to solve is a little bit different with Panorama. With Panorama, what we're trying to solve is how can you write an application, I'm sorry, you don't know that's the wrong slide. Oh, PowerPoint, how I love you. Uh, what we're trying to solve in Panorama is this problem of how do we enable people to uh, write an application that will run on any of these devices simultaneously? And without the developer having to know that those types of devices exist, and without the developer having to test the two to the n possible combinations of devices that their application might be running on. So I want to be able to write an application once that'll run on any of these devices, fine, but I want it also to work if, I'm, uh, if I have a tablet and a smartwatch, or a tablet and a phone, or a tablet and a Surface computer, and to spread itself out and do the right thing. So that's what Panorama is intended to do. So uh, Panorama at a high level does a couple of things. One, uh, it maintains a list of all the devices that uh, this application is running on at any given time. It's based on a web framework. And it maintains a list of what we call panels and distributes those panels based on the capabilities of the system combinations at any given time. So you take your web application, like here's YouTube, and you designate panels. So this is sort of a user experience problem. And I say, okay, here are the playback controls. That's one thing, that's one contiguous object that if it's, if, uh, it's gonna get sent to another device, they should all be on the same device. So I, as the application designer, know that that's the best behavior. We also have the video display, we also have the uh, list of videos, and I have the comments. Now, for each of those things, I specify attributes that will optimize the user's experience. So, for example, I specify that playback controls should be on a device that is within the user's reach. 
either because it's a touch screen and the user is holding it like a phone or because it's a device with a mouse. The video should be on the largest display. The, uh, the box that lets you enter comments should be on the device that has the best text entry experience. So I specify all of those attributes for my application and I provide them with this weighting. Right? So physical size, keyboard, touch quality, proximity to user, and how it matters. Then for any given device, they too get a score. PowerPoint really wants you to know about Tux, which is a fabulous program that uh, many people here have presented at. Uh, then what I also provide is scores for all of the devices. So televisions get big physical size attribute, laptop PC gets smaller physical size, but good keyboard quality, et cetera. And we're able, there actually are uh, frameworks that you can subscribe to for a fee that based on characteristics of the device when the application loads, gives you information about the device. It'll give you a model number of what device is actually running, despite the fact that the web is supposed to abstract a lot of that stuff away. Right? So you can get that information, and then we do just a linear solver to optimize at any given moment when I add a device, uh, which device should that be placed onto. And we minimize the burden on our application developers. This will be my last point. So you can take your existing web application that might be divided up into Canvas, and all you have to do is uh, recognize that these are the paneled areas and stick panel tags around them, and then define, uh, provide panel definitions based on the attributes that I just described a moment ago. So it's minimally burdensome on the developer. And then the idea is every time the user adds a device, they go to the website, they're logged into the Panelrama framework, it looks at all the panels, it performs a new uh, linear solver step and distributes the panels across the devices optimally. And the developer doesn't need to have designed or checked all of these attributes in the first place. Uh, the paper includes a developer study where we had people define all of these abstract values and then predict for any given combination of devices, we asked them, okay, where do you think your stuff's gonna go? To see if they could understand what would happen, if they really understood this optimization. And we found that uh, universally developers were able to do that. These were commercial developers, not PhDs in computer science. Yeah? Does the, the framework allow for changing of constraints and configurations? Because I imagine you optimize once at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But your workflow is fluid, so the devices may move. And what is that reach and not a reach, and convenient and not convenient may change over yeah. time. Does the, the so any given attribute that's dynamic is updated and then it recalculates the thing. The, the challenge with that, though, is that it can create a situation where you're flipping back and forth a lot, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if it's like which device is closest and you move it half an inch by mistake and now your stuff sort of all reflows there, right? So it's, it's not clear what the optimal user experience is, but this is our sort of first step at solving the problem. So if you have more than one application going on at a time, they can kind of interfere with each other, I would think. Uh, that's true. Well, tell me more about what you mean. Uh, well, you know, each one... Especially if I'm starting and stopping applications and things like that, it, it, it may they may make choices to, you know, suddenly you may find things moving around and where did where did my search panel go, oh, you know, yeah. and, and and those kinds of things. Yeah. So a question you have to ask yourself is, uh, what do you consider to be the recomputation moments, yeah. right? So you could, for example, b uh, decide well whenever a user first starts the application, I'll optimize for that. Whenever a user explicitly chooses to add a device, I'll recompute then. But other than that, I won't recompute, and I'll, give, I'll use like conductor-style control to let the user decide to then redistribute. All right, so we, anyway, Bill, thoughts? So in this, in terms of devices, would a secondary monitor that's plugged in as a peripheral be distinct and recognized in its attributes? Because the challenge is, is that I, this, I mean, I, this, you know I love this, this yeah. piece of work, but the, there's these little issues that actually make it complicated because when I'm giving a talk and I got three minutes to get up on stage and sometimes I can't even use my own um, PowerPoint that has to be on that. You know, that that's the problem with the robustness of, of PowerPoint. So this solution doesn't appear to extend to that situation and in particular where I'm in a place like you're here and you can't get on the network because you're right in your and, and if I'm going to, and also distinguishing 
machines which are public machines which are are not in the that in the conference room which which may or may not uh, be mine. Yes. So as long as all the devices are mine, I can sort of deal with the security. But this comes down to the social other aspect of social. That is, what's the nature of the kinship of the of the multiple devices plus the kinship to the networks, the multiple networks with different types of security that are in there. All of a sudden, it becomes complicated again. Yeah. So, so there's sort of two, and, and I'll say that, that, let me just close and then I'll answer your question, okay? So uh, I know we're at the hour, so people have to leave. I, I won't be offended, but I'll answer Bill's uh, point. But uh, anyway, so we've, I presented some stuff on ethnography uh, that sort of led to a bunch of these things, interaction design and development tools, which I think is the, sort of the most interesting problem. Um, so to Bill's point, so two things you said. One was, does it scale nicely, like does it answer the point I made earlier in the talk, which was don't focus on the CPU, don't focus on the CPU, think about the user's experience in terms of what is a device, right? In this instance, the answer is yes, to a limited extent, because this is a web framework. So if the user, uh, we know, for example, the size of the window, the actual physical size of the web view. So, uh, the tools that we subscribe to uh, tell us what is the physical size of the device that this thing is running on. It, they can, interesting, I don't remember if in 2014 if this is included in the paper or not, but the tool that, that we were using can say this is a 50 inch monitor as distinct from this is a monitor that is this number of pixels. And it's able to do that now with the, the open APIs. So it's solved like this much. Your second point, like, you know, this is one Kai paper. Okay. okay. Yeah. So then the second point was, how do you solve the problem of security, right? And, and, and also the internet goes down, right? Like how, how robust are we to all of those problems? We're a web framework, so we're reliant on people being able to get to websites. By making the choice to be a web framework, we are able to sort of get around yeah. the corporate security problems. As long as you can get to a web browser and log into your thing, this will work. But uh, have we solved all of the problems? Absolutely not, and it's a hard problem. And I would love for a company like Microsoft to start to solve the much, much larger problems. Uh, but what, what we're focused on in this project is how can a developer conceptualize of these things in a way that is useful to them, but solves the problem of how do they feel empowered? So when I remember when I was on the Surface team, on the Surface Table team, our designers were, were screaming. There weren't enough tables to go around for everyone. And so the designers were given 30-inch monitors because the diagonal of the surface table was 30 inches so that they could design for something to know the, the actual physical size, which mattered for direct touch. The designers were screaming because the color gamut of the projector in the surface wasn't anything like the LCD that was sitting on their desk, and it was making their jobs much harder, right? Mm -hmm. And you think about that level of, of precision that designers want to have, and now we're trying to enable this world where you don't even know, you know, is it on your wrist and it's this big, or is it on a tablet and it's this big, or is it on a wall and it's this big? So I'm, I'm really interested in why I'm so focused on developer experience of trying to find the right balance between giving developers and designers control and avoiding the situation where they have to consider the two to the end combinations of devices in designing their applications. That's the space we're trying to play. But, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah. You give a very good tease as to what I think is be a, like a future direction, which is development tools are great, but design tools are also equally important in delivering an experience that is useful and enjoyable. So you can, you can optimize linearly until you know, kingdom come, yeah. and things are going to be laid out a certain way, but it will look like crap. I don't want to use this because you know, I may not retent it. But what, what, what insights do you have as to what are the right things to try first in terms of creating design tools for this kind of multi-device scenarios? Yeah, so, uh, so about design tools. So I, I think it was Michael Niebling at, at Michigan developed a tool where you can, you can enter arbitrary combinations of devices and it'll show you what your application will look like. So you, can ch so you as a designer can sort of choose what are your target scenarios. Uh, I, I think a tool like that is really powerful because at least it lets designers, without forcing them to go and physically have every device that they might want to play with, so they can continue to do a linear optimization across their priorities. Uh, obviously, it's not a solution to the two to the end problem, but it's empowering, right? In terms of what are the sort of attributes that designers really care about in this space, 
Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't have intuition. And, and to me, that's what, what is so exciting to me about the area, is that every time I work with designers to try to explain this problem to them, the, the answer is always, no, I have to control that. No, I have to control that. No, I have to control that. Right? And the, the trust over digital tools has been so eroded by device fragmentation in the Android world, for example, uh, where you know anyone, does people remember this term, fragmentation, right? Mm -hmm. But people complain about Android because sometimes Android might be running on a 3.5 inch display or a 3.6 inch display, and they called it fragmentation, right? And then of course Samsung won, and now Android just means Samsung uh, to most people, right? But but back in the old days, they talk about fragmentation. Uh, designers who have worked with any of these frameworks get told, don't worry, you'll have the power, don't worry, you'll have the power, but then you know, they're not actually given enough time to solve the problems. So, so anyone who has real experience, they're, they're like battle scarred and there's, the, there's no trust. And I've seen this over and over and over and over again. Um, I think the, maybe the opportunity is to, to create design tools where designers feel empowered by creating the rules so that they can themselves uh, use tools like Panorama, but not just execute it at runtime, but instead let them define the heuristics that are resulting so that they feel like they have power and they're doing design work by working in the rule space, right? It makes them sound more like a developer. That's the best that I've been able to come up with in terms of making them feel empowered. But I don't know the answer. I think it's a... Maybe, maybe an opportunity to try to mechanize uh, the application of the design systems. You have things like, you know, fluent design or material design, but those are now applied to a human intervention. And I wonder if, if there's a way to, to have that uh, automated somehow. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. I think it'd be a really interesting problem to dive into. Yep. So it, it's, a, it's a really interesting challenge. And it, but one part of it, I think, there's some simple tools that could be done that would force a lot of the changes Again, just from the designer's perspective, is and also make a lot of talks a lot better because it could eliminate crap, crappy slides. Is to simply, and this is simple to do. I mean, relatively speaking, you build a previewer into PowerPoint. It assumes your eyes are this far away from your monitor, and therefore, what is the slide going to look like? Um, in a conference room on a 55 inch display viewed from this distance. And I can check legibility. What's it going to look like on a big monitor? A if, if, if conferences told me what's the resolution and how big is the room and how far is it in the back of the room, what's it going to look like? And I will find it right away. There's, you cannot design a slide that will work on all those conditions. But that's the big mistake because you get a consistency with the graphics, which is nonsense. We know that. Just like you're your, your, the interaction, the language of your phone changes 100% when you're in a car, it's audio in, audio out, versus fingers on, eyes on. And you don't notice it because it adapts. So first of all, can you make the thing so it's sentient, the application sentient, sort of like the old stuff in Georgia. But, and then the question comes down to, that means it has to know how to adapt. And so you build the adaptive behavior into the design process. Yeah. But the prerequisite to be able to do that is to, it, it's almost like a twin. Okay, here's how I arrange it on this situation. Here's how I do it that way. And then you figure it out. And, and so you have a matter of design. Or design by example. We're design by example. Yeah. And, and which goes, you know, right back to David Campbell Smith's Pygmalion. Yeah. It's just, um, so there's, but if you can do that part of adaptation, that, that makes some of these other things simpler. So now it's just a question of tell me what, what I need to know how to adapt. See, and, and I want that type of negotiation. And that's no sort of initial negotiation you're setting up. So I love it, yeah. right? But, but to me, you're asking, and I know we're over time. I really yeah. won't be offended if people just walk out and we can keep hanging out. Um, what, what you're talking about is, is getting designers to behave like computer scientists. And, and in that, you're asking them to work at a level of abstraction. I understand your point, though. No, no, I'm designed by I'm asking to act like yeah. interaction designers instead of graphic designers. Yes. And the problem is they're all graphic designers pretending they're interaction yes. designers. Yes. <laughs> so I have now had the experience of going to three different companies. One of them was Microsoft and being on the operating system team or consulting with the operating system team. And then looking at how the designers choose to allocate themselves, right? What, what do you want to work on? 
say the designer. Universally, Microsoft, other two companies, I can't tell you what they are. The, the designers choose to be on like the sample apps, right, or the shell. None of them want to be on the UI controls. Even though designing the UI controls is actually all the design that really happens in an operating system, right? And so what's interesting to me is where is that, where is that school, right? So where, where are designers learning that talent? And I think that's a whole other opportunity uh, for, for education and to find the sort of middle ground between developer and designer. Right? But, but, you know, anyway, I'd love, I'd love for it to happen. Sorry, Ken, where's... Uh, uh, probably should wrap up there. We said we do have some food outside, and I think it's for 20 people, but I think if we don't pay out, like, everyone can... Um, but, uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Daniel again for coming and kind of taking part of his day off and, like, visiting us instead of seeing his kid or whatever. So um, it's fantastic, and... Uh, yeah, I'll be around. How long are you around today for? I'll, I'll, I can hang out for another hour or so. Okay. So, yeah, so still feel free to join in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you.